How much would I throw you off if I sat here and preached from here? You're a very flexible and understanding congregation, right? Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that out loud. Good morning. It's good to be back after a very long hiatus. I haven't been here. My wife Liz is with me for quite a long time. And I have a joke that I tell you that would really make you laugh, but I won't because of my message is a little longer than you have meeting. So, anyway. Uh, the scripture that I want to open up is just two verses today. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, which says, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing love is from God and not from us. You know, sometimes you're reading through the Word and you've read it, how many times before? Sometimes a hundred. But this time, it goes, whoa, and something sticks out to you. Well, that's what you're getting. You're getting a Ralph whoa this morning. I'm going to spend some time in verse 7, but first, I want you to look what verse 6 says. As you look at this verse that's up on the screen, it says that God, what, what He did for us in Christ, He made His light, His light, shine in our hearts. And why? He tells us. To give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Look, uh, if I asked you, and I'm not doing that now, so you be quiet, <laughs> what glory is, I don't think we'd really be able to answer the question. Because I don't know as we know what glory, especially when it relates to God, is and the magnificence of it. The glory of God in the face of Christ, who is God, God the Son. Listen to two other verses. This is Colossians chapter 2, 2 and 3, where Paul writes this, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches, the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of, of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God wants us to have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, and 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says that He has shown it to us in the face of Christ. Now, God wants I've got that underlined three times in my notes. That means you're supposed to listen to it. God <laughs> wants us to have this light. He wants us to. Light's present in parts of the biblical account of Christ's birth. And, and you know that. Uh, you have a picture in your own mind, but what led the wise men to Bethlehem? Yeah. The Bethlehem star or... Uh, do you know Vince Morgan... I wonder if you know, he's a Jewish evangelist and uh, for Christ, Christian evangelist in the Jewish community. He was at my home overnight one night as they were at our church presenting something. And he said, well, stars don't stop over a place and, and tell you this is the place. Planets don't stop over a place and tell you the place. I like astronomy in college, right? And he's right. They don't stop. They keep moving. But this light stopped over the stable. He said, this was the Shekinah glory that stopped over that stable and pointed these wise men to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's present then. And in Luke chapter, we don't have this one down, Mark. In Luke chapter uh, 2, the angels visit the shepherds and it says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. Now, you and I weren't there, but what's your picture of that? I picture this black, star-studded sky, and then this angel appears. That's pretty dramatic, okay? And I'm sure that was a bright light when the angel, the heavenly angel comes. But then the Bible says, and then the heavenly host appeared and proclaimed the glory of God. Okay, what's, what's your picture of that? I mean, 
just, I picture just light everywhere with these creatures, heavenly creatures. It must have been astounding and filled with light. God is light. The first recorded words of God, you know what they are? Yeah. Genesis chapter 1, they're in verse 3. I'm going to read verses 2 and 3 here. They are, now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. Which, by the way, is what I believe is the event referred to in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, back to that. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Ralph, this is not a commentator, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I think that's referring back to Genesis chapter 1, where God said, let light shine out of darkness, and now it shines out of the darkness of our hearts. It's put there. From the beginning, God has wanted light in His world, and actually, that's not stated quite correctly. Better put, I should say, because God is light, and because God is in the world, Light had to be in the world, because God's light, and where he is, there's light. Before I attempt to verse, uh, open up verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, I want to read just a few verses about God's light that I hope are familiar to you. This is why I keep Mark busy going slide to slide to slide. 1 Timothy 6.16, who alone, speaking of God, who alone is immortal and who lives in, look at the word, unapproachable light. I'm not, I can't go through it this morning. Chronicles of Narnia, the voyage of the dawn treader, they're getting near Aslan's, the, the kingdom, his land, and they can't stand the brightness of the light. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is, how much darkness? No, no. no darkness at all. John 1, 4. In him, that is in Christ, was life. And that life was the light of men. The light everywhere. John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Acts 26, 18. To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Even at the end, in the celestial city, city described in Revelation, Revelation 21, 23, the city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. There's that word glory again, too. And the Lamb is its Lamb. The nations will walk by its light. Now, just before we look at verse 7, I want you to see some verses about light that relate specifically to us. They talk of us and they speak to us. Again, about light. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You, speaking to us, you are the light of the world. Whoa. 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin if we walk in the light. Ephesians 5.8, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. And Matthew 5.16, In the same way, let your light, your light, shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We're the light. Oh, okay. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God said, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Wow. So, the Word of God says that the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ gives us believers light. Now, 
If you don't do this when you read the Bible, please start doing it. Where it says things like, gives us, just change it to gives me. It gives me light. Where is this light in me? Well, the Bible tells us. Look at verse 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now, I know that I'm supposed to let my light, this light of Christ in me, so shine before men that they'll see my good deeds and glorify my Father in heaven. In fact, Luke 11.33 tells us, no one lights a lamp and puts it in a place where it'll be hidden or under a bowl, or I would say in a clay jar. Instead, they put it on its stand so that those who come in may see the light. Now, how, how do I do that? How do you do that? How do I do that? How do I let the light in my clay jar show through? Now, a clay jar, the clay jar, it could just mean uh, that its atom was made out of the earth. Eve taken for Adam. We're all dirt, all right? <laughs> Thus we were, the dust will return. We're all dirt. So it could mean that. But I've got an illustration here that I'm going to use. This is my illustration. This is Ralph's illustration, not the Bible's, okay? So you're clear on that. However, I think you'll find this very easy to understand. Uh, I hope you have your own picture of how this process happens and that you understand to whom it happens. My illustration has my clay jar being an opaque clay jar. In other words, if I took a flashlight and I put it in the clay jar, cap the top, you see nothing. Okay? Nothing at all. That's my clay jar that I picture. I picture myself the day I received Christ, receiving the light of Christ in my clay jar. And I recognize that the Holy Spirit in me wanted to work with me to let this light of Christ shine out from me to affect the lives of other people. As the days and years went on, I found that that was exactly what was happening. Through occurrences that happened outside my control sometimes, but mostly, mostly through choices that I made, that I was led to make by the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit was working in me to poke holes in my clay jar. As I read his word, <laughs> never wear an Apple Watch when you read <laughs> You'll take that home more than anything I say. <laughs> As I read his word and saw more and more of who the Bible says God is, I recognized the falsehood of the image that I had had of God and the falsehood of parts of what I had believed my relationship with Him was. I had been wrong as I read the Bible and found out what the Bible says it is. Through my reading and studying in the Word of God, I also found that the images of God that some other people had described to me about their relationships with God, that they were either biblically incomplete and sometimes biblically incorrect. They were merely other people's thoughts, their thoughts, about how God, who God was, and his relationship with them. Thoughts like I have had. As this happened over time, I saw and I recognized and I understood God's deep love for his people. And when I say that, for his people, what I say when I'm alone with the Bible is his deep love for me, for me, for Ralph. And the result was that the attitude with which I faced, faced life changed to one of more joy. Uh, it was uh, wonderful. The attitude also changed to one of anticipation. As these things happened and I realized more, 
my attitude was, wow, this is great. Lord, what's next? As these things unfolded, I was pleased to realize, as I looked down at my clay jar, that it had more holes in it, and more light was shining out of my clay jar. Because of these new revelations which poked holes through my previously faulty clay thoughts and beliefs, my jar was allowing more of the light of Christ that was inside me to show through. My life became more patient, more peaceful, more positive, and I loved it. That light that I had been given and was now shining through these few holes in my jar was Christ himself. Christ was manifesting himself through me. I realized as I read the word, I'm not supposed to imitate Christ. In one place the word is used in certain translations. But no, imitating would be like, okay, I look at that now. I have to do the same thing. He says, no, no, Ralph, that's not it. What you need to do is let me live through you. The right way to look at it is, I need to allow Christ to manifest himself through me. That's what the Bible teaches. And yield to him. Others, uh, observing others and interacting with them has poked many a hole in Ralph's jar. It's not just my study of the Word, though that has been enormous in, in learning about God and poking holes in my jar. Topping that list of other people is Liz, who sits here. She and I have had a habit of having devotions and then sharing with each other on certain days what we've learned, especially things that struck us. And I've learned a great deal from listening to her and also from watching the Holy Spirit work in her life. But I have other examples outside our family as well, and I want to share with you just a few, and I hope you'll recognize them. Just maybe file them away so that when these types of things happen to you, you can use them to poke holes in your clay jar. I was a director of Northern Frontier Camp for 21 years. During the summer, uh, there was a store time for the older kids and another store time for the younger kids. Well, during one of those younger kids' store times, I was, had been at my computer for hours in the office, and the, the store is on the porch of the office, and I, I said I need a break. So I just went out and stood on the porch and watched the conversations of the kids. It's really refreshing. And one boy, when he was probably 10 years old, walked up to the window, and I heard the counselor very nicely tell him, he said, oh, I'm sorry, so-and-so, I forget his name. I'm sorry, but you've already used all your money, all the money that you brought. And so the kid, shoulders down, head went down, and he walked over toward the bench that was on the porch. He had a friend sitting there. The friend looked up at him and said, what's wrong? And the kid said, I already used all my money. And the kid didn't miss a beat, the kid who was watching. He said, oh, no problem, come here, sit down, here, have some of mine. And he took half his candy bars and gave them to him. And I said, wow, that's something. Now, as I watched this happen, and folks, uh, I, I know some charismatic folks. I'm not one of them, okay? I have never heard a voice with my ears. I've never seen a vision with my eyes, all right? But God has communicated with me, okay? Just in, in my spirit. And what, what happened there was, Ralph, I want you to reflect more of my giving nature. I want you to reflect more of my giving nature taught to me by a 10-year-old boy to whom I never spoke a word. And it poked a hole in my jaw. I was reading one time you know, some story somewhere about the patience of a caregiver of an Alzheimer's mother, who's a daughter. And a neighbor came over, and she was uh, uh, observing. The neighbor was observing, and the mother would ask the same question every perhaps three minutes. And the daughter would answer the question in the same way, with the same bright smile, and the same demeanor toward her mom. And when the mother had left, take a nap or whatever, the neighbor said, I cannot believe how much patience I was going nuts here in the same thing again and again, but you just gave her the most pleasant answer every time. Then, 
later in my life with a, uh, an extended family member whose father had Alzheimer's, I watched incredible impatience in that relationship. And I saw the result of both kinds of lives. And God, with his spirit, in me says, well, who do you want to be? Who do I want you to be? He said, you want to reflect. I want you to reflect. I want you to manifest that part of the, the fruit of my spirit that we call patience in your life, that you may magnify my name. And I heard it. Many years ago, and I, this is a lot of years ago, this is before Liz and I were married, I remember hearing someone, one of my friends, say something negative. I mean, it was a bad situation about someone else and, and what had been done to this friend of mine. <coughs> but was the other guy was a friend of mine too. And I listened to him, and without any more information, I made a judgment and was negative toward that second friend until finally the subject came up and he said, wait a minute, that's not how it happened. And he told me the other side of the story. And I went, oh my heavens. And as I listened, I realized that I had truly spoken out of turn. Well, God told me right then, well, I'm going to develop in you work to cultivate in you the trait of discernment. And discernment now, not, not something supernatural particularly, but learning how to ask questions before opening your mouth about anything else. And so, two verses, it's a uh, proper, they're not there, don't worry about it. <laughs> Proverbs 18, 13, he who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Second, 1817 in Proverbs, the first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. The reason I can tell you those two verses from memory is because of this event in my life pushed me to memorize those verses so that I would be more discerning in my relationships with people in order to magnify the name of Christ. Seeing the results, another example of two kinds of lives. Again, these are extended family members. One, which had been focused on money. The second, which had been focused on God. God, again, in that way, He communicates to people like me. Essentially, He said to me, Ralph, look at these people's end-of-life faces. Look at them. And look at the faces of those around them, their family members and whatever. Now look at the faces of the others and those around those people. And I looked, and you can guess what I saw. The peace, the happiness of the one, and the anger and the bitterness of the other. And he said this to me, and again, it's a verse that you know. Matthew 6, 33, it's not there, Mark. <laughs> Seek first my kingdom, he says, his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first my kingdom, God essentially said to me. These observations didn't pass without having a deep effect upon Ralph Essery. They poked holes in my clay jar. God has used many, many people in my life as a means to poke holes in my jar so that more of the light of the Son of God can show through. It's my belief that the goal of every Christian is found in Romans 8.29. That's not there either. <laughs> Romans 8.29 essentially says, part of the verse, do not, or excuse me, uh, be conformed to the likeness of His Son, of Christ. Be conformed to the likeness of Christ. That's what I believe, uh, that's what I've taken as my goal and, uh, now, I'm going to make you mad, some of you, because you don't like to be told what to do. I think that's your goal, too, even if you don't know it. That's the goal of every Christian, to be conformed to the likeness of Christ, Romans 8, 29. The process of sanctification in me is me working with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can poke more holes in my junk. 
Now, taking advantage of this image that I've given you and the English language happily allows me to do this, in order for me to be more holy, H-O-L-Y, I have to be more holy, H-O-L-E-Y. Now, who does this in the life of the Christian? Well, there are two simultaneous answers to that. You know them already. I tell you with personal certainty that it's the Holy Spirit who has poked the holes in my jar, that He has been the agent of my sanctification. The Holy Spirit has the power to poke holes in a believer's life, in their jar, so to speak, so that the light of Christ may shine through. His job on earth, after all, is to magnify the name of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to reveal Christ to this world in which we live with Him inside us. However, a secondary and necessary answer must be understood. Let me illustrate this by telling you about my very good friend now in heaven. His name is Bud Smith. Bud was the assistant director of Northern Frontier Camp. Some of you may have known him, met him, and loved him like I did. He was a very fine man of God. I worked with him for 20 years, and I miss him terribly. He died last December of COVID. Uh, he would have staff members of Northern Frontier come to him and say, Captain Bud, I'm, I'm sick of the way I'm living. I want to live a more holy life. I want to. I really do. He said, I see him and him and him pointing to other counselors at Northern Frontier. And he said, I want to live a life like that. I see the respect and I respect these guys for their desire to serve Christ. I want to be more like that. Well, they didn't know what they were letting themselves in for. But after listening to the whole thing, would look at him and say, this shouldn't sit so far out, I'm going to pick on you. And would look at the, that person and say, do you want to be a holy man? The first time he said that, the guy, of course, thinks, that's what I've just been saying. And so we'd say, yes, I do. Bud would pause a moment or two, and then he'd look at them again and say, Do you want to be a holy man? And they'd a little more pause, and they'd say, Yes, I do. All right, so <coughs> let's get this now. Bud would then look at them after a pause and say, Do you want to be a more holy man? This time, longer pause perhaps, but finally the answer, if these guys were serious, would come back. Yes, I do. I do. Then Bud would say to them, then be a holy man. Okay? Whoa. You think you don't have what it takes within you to be holy? You're going to tell that to the Holy Spirit who lives within you? So we put these guys right on the spot. And look, now, there's a partnership here between you and the Holy Spirit. Now, God would continue on, and he would say this. He would tell them about the, what these young men who, who this counselee looked at as being more holy than they were. He would tell them what they went through. He would tell them the things that they pursued and the things that they gave up in order to be the holy man that that person recognized in them. Like giving up friends. Now I'm talking a teenager here or a guy in his young 20s. Giving up friends who led them away from Christ. You and I as adults here, that's easier for us than it is for a teen. Seeking friends who would support them in their pursuit of holiness finding friends and hanging out with those who would help them grow, giving up wasteful uses of time in order to pursue godly pursuits, godly things, giving up significant or giving significant time to the Word of God. 